This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Toni Morrison, one of the nation's most influential writers, has died at the age of 88. She died Monday in the Bronx from complications of pneumonia. In 1993, Toni Morrison became the first African-American woman to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. She also won a Pulitzer Prize in 1988 for her classic work, Beloved. Toni Morrison was born in Lorain, Ohio, in 1931. She did not publish her first novel, The Bluest Eye, until she was 39 years old. She wrote it while taking care of her two young sons as a single mother and juggling a day job as a book editor at Random House. As an editor, she's widely credited with helping widen the literary stage for African Americans and feminists. Much of Morrison's writing focused on the female black experience in America. Her writing style honored the rhythms of black oral tradition. Her work was deeply concerned with race and history, especially the sin of transatlantic slavery and the potentially restorative power of community. In 2012, President Obama awarded Toni Morrison the Presidential Medal of Freedom. On Tuesday, President Obama said, quote, Toni Morrison was a national treasure. Her writing was not just beautiful, but meaningful, a challenge to our conscience and a call to greater empathy. Her friend Oprah Winfrey said Tuesday, quote, she was our conscience, our seer, our truth teller. She was a magician with language who understood the power of words. She used them to royal us, to wake us, to educate us, and help us grapple with our deepest wounds and try to comprehend them. In a moment, we'll be joined by three remarkable writers who knew Toni Morrison well—Angela Davis, Sonia Sanchez and Nikki Giovanni. But first, we turn to the trailer, to the new documentary, Toni Morrison. The pieces I am. My grandfather bragged all the time that he had read the Bible, and it was illegal in his life to read. Ultimately, I knew that words have power. I wanted as many people who could hear my voice to understand the importance of her work. Get people to trust, like, oh, this is something safe, and then, bam, hit them with Toni Morrison. One of them, early review, says she's got a great talent. One day, she won't limit it to only writing about black people. Like, really, it's limiting for her to write about black people? People began to buy Toni Morrison, and then we began to teach her, and as a consequence, they had to pay attention. I know you're sick unto death of being labeled a black writer. I prefer it. Oh, I thought you probably were tired of it. Well, I'm tired of people asking the question. Oh, oh yes, of course. <laughs> I don't know where this woman's energy came from to raise two kids, to bring other people of color to the party, and also write these novels. Tony was an editor at Random House. Navigating a white male world was not threatening. It wasn't even interesting. I was more interesting than they were. And I wasn't afraid to show it. Suddenly, the canon wasn't the private property of white male writers. I've thrown this book across the room and then walked down the steps laughing. Like, you read Tony and you cry, but you gotta laugh. Texas Bureau of Corrections banned Paradise because it might incite a riot. And I thought, how powerful is that? <laughs> Morrison published Beloved. It was an extraordinary turning point. We can never think about slavery in the same way. A friend of mine called me up early in the morning and said, Tony, you won the Nobel Prize. And I remember holding the phone thinking, she must be drunk. Tony Morrison's work shows us through pain all the myriad ways we can come to love. That is what she does, with some words on a page. The trailer for Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am. As we continue to look at the remarkable life of Toni Morrison, we're joined by three guests, her dear friends and colleagues. 
Angela Davis, the renowned activist and author, distinguished professor emerita at the University of California, Santa Cruz, a close friend of Toni Morrison for over 40 years. Toni Morrison edited her 1974 book, Angela Davis, an Autobiography. She's joining us on the phone from California. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, we're joined by Sonia Sanchez, award-winning poet, one of the foremost leaders of the Black Studies and the Black Arts Movement, author of 20 books including Morning Haiku and Shake Loose My Skin. She was also a dear friend of Toni Morrison. And we're joined by Nikki Giovanni, poet, activist, educator, currently the university distinguished professor at Virginia Tech. Professor Giovanni is the author of over two dozen books, her most recent, A Good Cry, What We Learn from Tears and Laughter. We're going first to Angela Davis. Can you talk about the legacy of Toni Morrison and then how you first came to know her, Professor Davis? Well, um, good morning, Amy. Um, um, I'm, I'm still, of course, recovering um, uh, from the news that Toni is no longer with us. But I think it's important for us to recognize how her words have radically altered the lives that we, we live. Um, um, she has helped to transform our collective sensibilities and, and also our awareness of the place of art and literature in, in, in the world. You know, sometimes I, I think back to the way in which I imagined slavery um, before reading Beloved. Uh, and I realized how abstract uh, that imagination was. Um, she taught us, I think probably for the very first time, to imagine enslaved women and men with with full lives, with complex subjectivities, with interiority. And I think that her work has literally revolutionized the way people all over the world um, think not only about black people in the U.S., but how they imagine their own lives and, and their past. Uh, And, and their future. I met Toni Morrison for the first time um, not long after the conclusion of my trial. Um, she was an editor at Random House Publishing Company, and she approached me with the idea of my writing an autobiography. And Of course, at that particular moment, I wasn't interested in writing an autobiography. Besides, I was 28 years old, and I thought, who writes an autobiography in their 20s? Uh, you know, this is a project that should wait several decades. Uh, uh, and I also um, imagined the, the, the autobiography as genre, as something that was produced by uh, people who had standing in the world, who felt that uh, they had lived their lives in a way that would provide um, models for, for people in the world. And, and I told her this, um, but she was very insistent. And uh, when I explained what kind of work um, I might produce that might not fit into the genre of a um, what I thought was would be an individualistic autobiography. She persuaded me that 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 I could write a political uh, autobiography. Um, um, and um, Tony, uh, of course, um, had a way of creating the arguments that could persuade you to do anything. So eventually, I agreed, and that was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. I'm so happy that I wrote that autobiography, if only for the reason that it 
introduced me to Toni Morrison. I want to go, Angela, to a clip from a 2010 conversation between Toni Morrison and you, Angela Davis, at the New York Public Library. Um, she sort of laboriously came up onto the stage and immediately joked about how she had just had hip replacement. Uh, the rest of her body had to catch up with her magic hip. But you were both speaking at the event called Frederick Douglass, Literacy, Libraries and Liberation. Here, Toni Morrison talks about the legal creation of whiteness. The interesting thing is that the, the, they established these laws. And the laws were very, very interesting. They said things like, any, no black shall be allowed to carry a weapon, ever, for any circumstances. <laughs> Second, any white can maim or kill any black for any reason without being charged. Now, you see what that did to the indentured servants who were white? Now, they're better. Freer, more powerful. They're the same situation. They're still enslaved, but they're not, but they can carry weapons and they can beat up black slaves without punishment. Mm -hmm. So they have this little margin of status, nothing else, nothing else, but that little margin. And that little margin has worked its way through this country since then. That was in the 17th century. And you know, the Southern strategy, you know, all these things in which you, you know, flag race and racism as a cause or even a goal. You know, racism is not a goal, it's a path, it's just a route to power and money. That's what it is, that's what it's for, whether it's via war or segregation or what have you. The thing itself is just a manipulation and a tool. And its purpose is um, what I just described that went on after the Bacon mm -hmm. Rebellion. I wanted to turn to Nikki Giovanni right now, poet, activist, professor, currently the university distinguished professor at Virginia Tech. Uh, professor Giovanni is the author of over two dozen books, her latest, uh, Good Cry, What We Learned from Tears and Laughter. Uh, professor Giovanni, I went to see you at Virginia Tech years ago. It was after the Virginia Tech massacre. We sat in your office, and you kept getting interrupted by phone calls because you were extremely excited about preparing this event at Virginia Tech, where you and Maya Angelou would be celebrating the life of Toni Morrison. Uh, she was coming. It was after the death of her son, and you just wanted to cheer her up and share her magnificence with the world. Um, can you talk about how you first met Toni Morrison and what she has meant for you? Well, I, I first met Toni uh, because I stalked her. I read The Bluest Eye, and uh, I was living in New York, and simply walked—I lived on 92nd and Central Park West, and I walked down to Random House, because I never did understand how to take a, a subway. And I walked down to Random House and said, you know, I'd like to see Toni Morrison. And the uh, security guard said, you know, is she expecting you? And I said, well, no. And he said, well, who are you? And I wrote my name and sent it up, and she sent the message back, asked her to wait. And she came back down after a few—I guess she cleaned her desk or whatever. And uh, we went across the street and had, uh, had a cup of coffee. And it was just, uh, you know, when you're talking to any genius, you're— uh, shy. I don't know if I'm shy, but certainly trying to find uh, the right words. But uh, we, we had the cup of coffee, and a, a relationship um, grew out of that. Uh, Maya, I was—when when Slade died, I went down to see Maya, and I say down because Maya was at uh, Wake Forest, and uh, I said, you know, what should we do? And it wasn't cheer her up, because uh, you, you lose a child, you, you can't be cheered up. But um, it was to comfort. And the sisterhood had to come in. And good morning, uh, Angela, and good morning, Sonia, because all of, both of them, uh, we called Angela right away because I knew that they were close. And of course, Sonia came. We had a sheer good fortune because Tony had said it's sheer good fortune to miss someone before they're gone. 
and I'd like, like to say, you know, we, we're talking about it today, that we, we've lost Tony. But Tony Morrison is, is, is Shakespeare. Tony Morrison is a storyteller like Jesus. We, we will never lose Tony Morrison. She will always be here. And she'll be here in somebody else's mind, and, and she'll look like something. You know, we'll, we'll look like we're fighting about how does Shakespeare look or something. But Tony Morrison will always be with us, because she's, she has created a, a, a body of work of genius. And uh, it, it'll always be there. It, it, 200 years from now, we'll be reading Tony. Professor Giovanni, you mentioned the bluest eye. Um, I want to go to another clip of that 2010 conversation between Tony and Angela Davis at the New York Public Library. When I wrote the first book I wrote, The Bluest Eye, I really wanted to know why that girl felt so bad, the one who, a real life girl, who said she wanted blue eyes. We were talking about the whether God existed. I, of course, was persuaded that he did. And she was persuaded that he did not, and her proof was that she had prayed for blue eyes for two years. Two years? And she didn't get them, though obviously he wasn't up there. But when I looked at her and thought about how awful she would look, if she got them. And then I thought, the second thing was how beautiful she was at that moment, you know. She was just incredible, but I didn't even know whether she was beautiful or not until I thought about what she might think. Then the third thing, of course, is why does she want that? You know, what, what makes her think that's an improvement? And that kind of self-loathing, which is real, you know, in, when you don't have any support, made me, you know, think of that as a, as a real subject for a book. Not some, oh, victim, but really how it works. Nikki Giovanni, as Toni Morrison talks about um, writing The Bluest Eye, uh, about a young black girl in rural Ohio in the 1940s, uh, who was raped by her father, driven to madness, um, if you can talk about the significance of this book and why you walk to meet her, it was a 2000 pick for the Oprah Winfrey's book club. And people might say, oh, why are you raising that now? Well, actually, Oprah Winfrey said she wouldn't have even have made a book club if it weren't for Toni. Morrison, Nikki Giovanni. And, and I think she's right. You know, Piccola didn't like herself. And I think that's what Tony was, was dealing with, that Piccola, the, the bluest eye was just a, a metaphor. Piccola wanted to be something that somebody could be seen, that she could look at herself. And I'll tell you, the kid that I like so much right now is Renee Watson, who is a big woman. And she's begun writing about what it is to be a big woman, that she can look at herself, because y you look at yourself and you say, oh, I'm too fat. I'm, I'm somebody who, who always needs to gain weight, because I've, I've had a, a, a situation with cancer. I'm not fighting cancer. I'm trying to live with it. But I need to gain weight. I need to make sure that my weight doesn't—I don't want to lose weight. And we live in a world that—, that I turn on my television, and it's like, wow, you can lose weight. I don't want to lose weight. I want to gain weight. But there are people who are waiting, who are big, and, and nobody's writing about them, except Renee is writing about them. I think she's a brilliant young woman. I think the next uh, Nobelist should be Edwidge Dadekin, who is just an incredibly wonderful, wonderful writer. So when we start to look at what made Piccola, if Piccola had been able to read Renee, or had been able to read uh, 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 Ed Wedge, or had been able, for that matter, to read, uh, and I love him so much, Kwame Alexander, if she had been able to find somebody that said, but, but you are, you are a pretty girl, it's all right. And you say, well, rape is a horrible thing. I think rape is pretty bad. I've never been raped, so I'm happy about that. But I think that it's not something that the person who was raped did. It's something that was done to you. And so things that are done to you, you have to find a way to push that. You have to find a way to push that, that back. It's not your fault. And I think that, that Tony was, was taking the steps to say, it's not your fault. I mean, Ohio, look at Ohio right now, and that'd be a whole discussion that we're not going to have. But look at Dayton. And look, I mean, you, you look at what's happening in look at what happened in America, and so we got to do better. So we need a little more. We we need a little more Tony Morrison's. 
<clears throat> and I do actually want to talk about that with you before the end of the show, because here you are at Virginia Tech, 32 people killed in the massacre there. You taught the actual shooter, and that's another discussion, but I do want to get back to it. However, I want to go to Sonia Sanchez right now, the award-winning poet, one of the foremost leaders of the Black Studies and Black Arts Movement, author of 20 books, including Morning Haiku and Shake Loose My Skin. Um, Sonia, you've said what Tony has done with her literature is that she's made us look up and see ourselves. Explain when you first discovered her, how you teach her to your students, what she has meant in your own writing. Uh, good morning, um, Sister Angela and Sister Nikki and Sister Amy. Uh, it is good being on this program. I'm, I, I just had surgery on my mouth yesterday, so I'm hoping that you <laughs> can understand uh, what I'm saying. Um, but um, my dear sister, um, um, we were at the beginning of the Black Studies uh, movement here in America, and I was blessed to uh, teach, initiate the first course on uh, the black woman uh, in America, and that was at the University of Pitt um, in 1969. And of course, when I moved back to uh, the East and came back home, I then had to begin to look for books and other books that I had had to include in that discussion of black women. And I, of course, read The Bluest Eye. Let me tell you, my dear sister, when I read The Bluest Eye, I sat down on the floor. You know, I read in all kinds of positions, sometimes in bed, stretched out, sometimes on the couch, you know, sitting rigidly rigid, uh, sometimes walking back and forth uh, as I read. Um, I did not put that book down. I literally started it from the beginning, and later on that night, up in my study, where I had ended with a cup of hot tea, that I began to finish that book. Um, and, you know, and what I knew that this woman, this Sister Toni Morrison, did something uh, uh, with language, with words, um, how she, in a sense, in that book and all the other books, um, um, untangle uh, this language that had captured us in this place called America, how she began to stand those words up, uh, and how she let those words minuet our blood, you know. And so she opened up this thing called sorcery, the sorcery of our language. Um, and, and she was spitting teeth. Um, on uh, on on our words, and but she was recapturing uh, our most sacred vows, those vows in our language, uh, in a place called America, and um, you know um, I, I I taught that um, that book um, that was one of the books that I constantly taught that I always said to Sister Tony. When people began to talk about her greatest book, you know, I said, well, you know, I always gravitate back towards The Bluest Eye uh, because of what it says and what it does uh, uh, for us uh, uh, as black women. I, at some point, uh, began to look and understand that, you know, in many African cultures, um, when you have twins, it is said that the first twin uh, that comes out comes out, you know, to search and make sure it's okay for the second twin. So you come out and you look around. I maintain when I teach that the bluest eye was that first twin coming out, looking around, searching. Say, is it okay to say this? Is it okay what I'm going to say? Is there fertile land for this? Are there fertile eyes for this? Are there fertile? Is there fertile memory for what I'm going to say? You know, and then all the other. All the other children came out, from Sula on down, you know, to Beloved. But that first one, the bluest eye, was the one that came out to say, hey, is it safe to do this? Um, let me tell you what's happening out here as you prepare to bring us these other books, right? So one of the things, every time I, I read her, I would always put on my eyes, 
You know, I used to tell her this, uh, because I'm, I was always in the eyelash of her memory, um, where there was always uh, a miracle, miracle called Sister Toni Morrison. We continue to look at the life and legacy of Toni Morrison. She was the first African-American woman to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. She also won a Pulitzer Prize. I want to turn to an interview that Toni Morrison gave to the Australian journalist Jana Wendt. It was 1998 for the program Toni Morrison Uncensored. You don't think you will ever change and write books that incorporate white, white lives into them substantially? I have done. In a substantial way. You can't understand how powerfully racist that question is, can you? Because you could never ask a white author, when are you going to write about black people? Whether he did or not, or she did or not. Mm. Even the inquiry comes from a position of being in the center. And being used to being in the center. And being used to being in the center. Mm. And saying, you know, is it ever possible that you will enter the mainstream? It's inconceivable that where I already am is the mainstream. Oh, no, I, that, that wasn't the implication of my question. I think you are very, very much in the mainstream. But it's a question of the, the subject of your narrative, whether you want to alter the parameters of it, whether you see any, um, any benefit in doing that, or will you clearly see disadvantages in doing it from your own point of view? Artistic disadvantages. There are no pluses for me. Being an African-American writer is sort of like being a Russian writer who writes about Russia in Russian for Russians. And the fact that it gets translated and read by other people is a benefit. It's a plus. But he's not obliged to ever consider writing about French people or Americans or anybody. That's Toni Morrison being interviewed by the well-known Australian journalist Jenna Wendt back in 1998. And I wanted to go back to Angela Davis, the renowned activist, author, professor, distinguished professor emeritus University of California, Santa Cruz. Your thoughts as you listen uh, to that conversation. Well, Toni Morrison um, completely altered our ways of thinking about race. Um, um, and I think about that, that little volume that, that she wrote of um, literary cri criticism, Playing in the Dark, in which she um, um, wrote about the extent to which literature in, 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 in the U.S., always depended on the present absence of, of black people. Uh, um, I think that um, her insistence on writing about the black experience, black life in America, but not in a way that um, demeaned or marginalized uh, black people. Uh, uh, you know, what was so remarkable about Tony was that she, she taught us that um, the real power of, 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 of writing can transform our ways of thinking, of, 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 of feeling. And if we imagine slaves uh, previously as abstract figures, she taught us that, that what was so remarkable about the experience of, of black people during slavery was not so much the suffering. And of course, when, um, when we think about slavery, inevitably the assumption is it's all about the, the, the violence, it's all about the suffering. But what she taught us that, was that the most remarkable aspect of the black experience in North America was the way in which uh, black people 
transform the the most horrendous forms of of suffering into beauty, into joy. Um, And I think we'll never again um, be able to make the assumption that writing about black people, you know, somehow um, will always be marginal, as the Australian uh, journalists uh, seem to assume. I want to turn to Toni Morrison again. This is uh, at Portland State University in 1975. It's important, therefore, to know who the real enemy is and to know the function, the very serious function of racism, which is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language, and so you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says that you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says you have no kingdoms, and so you dredge that up. None of that is necessary. There will always be one more thing. The distraction is no different from bombing Cambodia to keep the North Vietnamese from making their great push. And since not history, not anthropology, not social sciences seem capable in a strong and consistent way to grapple with that problem, it may very well be left to the artists to do it. Toni Morrison speaking in 1975. Special thanks to the Portland State Library. Professor Nikki Giovanni, I'd like you to respond uh, to what she said here and to her response to the Australian reporter who asked when she would incorporate white lives in, into her books in a substantial way. Morrison hitting back, saying, you can't understand how powerfully racist that question is. Uh. Uh, I'm, I'm not your girl for for literary critics uh, uh, or criticism. I, I it, maybe it's just a bad day, but uh, that's just not really what I do, and it's not what I did with Tony. And I, I've had a lot of famous friends. Tony's one of them. And the one thing that I think I offer as a friend was that to be with me was not to have to explain any of it, was not to have to talk about it. And we used to laugh, because I think the only thing that— if you get a bunch of black women and black women writers together, we never talk about who's a great writer or who's the best writer. We do always talk about who's the best cook. So that—and I know I'm one of the best cooks, and I used to fight with Maya about that. But you, you've asked a question that's a, a sincere question, but it's not a question that at eight— I'm 76, and I'm just not prepared to uh, address it, and, and so— and, and, and so I can't. I, I just wanted— I'm, I wanted to be here today because you asked me to be here for Tony. And I wanted to be here today to simply say that Tony will always be with us. That, 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 that's reality. Tony will be with us. She was a storyteller. Her work, as far as I can see, for whatever literary criticism I can offer, goes directly back to the spirituals, which is what she was talking about. And I'm a big fan of the spirituals. But that's about all I can offer. I'm, I'm, I'm here to simply say, I love Tony. We were friends. We, we laughed together. We cooked together. We, when I was in New York, we, um, we went out to— there were a couple of restaurants we both liked. We went out there. When, when she lost her son, I wanted to offer whatever comfort I could. She's the one in Beloved who said there's no— there's not even a bench. And I wanted to be a bench, because a bench is a metaphor. A bench is not a piece of furniture. It's a metaphor. And I wanted to be a bench. For Tony, I wanted I wanted to be a bench, and that's all. I'm here today. Mm. I I'm want... just a bench. She lost her son Slade, who she wrote children's books with. He died of pancreatic cancer. I wanted to turn to Toni Morrison's Nobel lecture from December 1993, when she became the first African American woman to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. Oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence. 
does more than represent the limits of knowledge. It limits knowledge. Whether it is obscuring state language or the faux language of mindless media, whether it is the proud but calcified language of the academy or the commodity-driven language of science, whether it is the malign language of law without ethics or language designed for the estrangement of minorities, hiding its racist plunder in its literary cheek, it must be rejected, altered, and exposed. It is the language that drinks blood, laps vulnerabilities, tucks its fascist boots under crinolines of respectability and patriotism as it moves relentlessly toward the bottom line and the bottomed out mind. Sexist language, racist language, theistic language, all are typical of the policing languages of mastery and cannot, do not permit new knowledge or encourage the mutual exchange of ideas. That is Toni Morrison giving her Nobel address when she was awarded the Nobel uh, Prize for Literature. It became the first African-American woman to win that prize. Uh, she won the Pulitzer in 1988 for her book, Beloved. I wanted to turn to Senya Sanchez as a longtime teacher, professor, award-winning poet. What did these accolades mean for an African-American female writer at the time, given how often these literary accolades are, are so dominated by white men for so long? Sonia. <laughs> right. Well, it was such a joy to see uh, our dear sister Toni uh, receive the Pulitzer here and most certainly uh, receive uh, the Nobel. I was up writing one night. Um, I was behind, as usual, and I was watching the idiot box. Uh, I'm sorry, the television, and um, and they flashed on that Toni Morrison had received the Nobel Prize. So I called her house, and there was no answer. And I called her house um, where she was living up in New York, and her son answered and said, you know, she's home. And I called her back, and I said, Tony, t she picked up the phone. I said, Tony, Tony, you won the Nobel. And she said, Sonia, 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 you know, are you serious? Are you drunk? Are you whatever? And I said, no, I'm neither of those things. And we must really talk about this and celebrate. And after we talked about it, she says, let's get down to the real business of what we're going to wear uh, <laughs> there. But my dear, dear sisters, you know, one of the things I know at this point is that um, uh, she said, we die, that may be the meaning of life, but we do language, that may be the measure of our lives. Um, and this, this, this brilliant woman, this, 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 this Toni Morrison woman um, uh, gave us uh, the language, uh, gave us the words. Uh, her literature assu assured us all that life would go on, that life does not end uh, when we die, um, that the story is left unfinished with all the people coming behind us, those young writers who will come behind us and will continue this great tradition that Sister Toni Morrison set for us all. I, I want to thank you so what? much all for joining us, Sonia Sanchez, Angela Davis, Nikki Giovanni. Visit Democracy Now! Dora to watch the 2004 conversation with Toni Morrison and Cornell West and so much more. That does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.